All right, welcome back to KM6 LYW Radio, the show about amateur radio or ham radio with an emphasis on digital or data modes, moving information back and forth, trying to reimagine amateur radio in the information age. Hey, today we're going to talk about standing wave ratios or SWRs. Uh, what is it and why do you care? This time on KM6 LYW Radio. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Let's make me a lot smaller here. Make me really small. So what we're looking at, guys, is a standing wave. That's exactly what this image is here. Let me make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. Um, so uh, in your, with your radio, it's sending out waves through a some sort of coax or some sort of line, feed line. And it's going out to an antenna, and those waves are going back and forth across the antenna and radiating into space. Um, but in, if your antenna or your feed line or something's wrong, um, some of those waves won't go out into space. They will actually come back into your house, back into your radio, and that's bad. That's a, basically a reflected wave, and that causes a standing wave in the wire. Um, so here we see like the, the blue wave going out. I don't know if you can see the colors really well. I think I can make this a little bit bigger. The blue wave is going out from left to right. Like your radio is over here on the left and your antenna is over on the right. And you can see this blue wave just cruising back all the way to the right out to your antenna. <clears throat> Now, if something's wrong with your feed point or your antenna or something else, um, there's going to be a reflected wave coming back. That's what this red one is. See this red one coming back? This one's bad news. The reason you don't want one of these waves coming back is because it's going to go right back into your radio. So if your radio is actually like pushing out a wave right now and that red wave is coming up high and pushing back, they're going to cancel each other out. You're not going to get any signal. What's worse is you're going to have uh, your radio pulling current from your antenna and you're going to have that wave coming back and you're going to get a sudden inrush of current into your radio. Too much current leads to heat. Heat leads to suffering. Yeah, you can blow up your radio. So standing wave ratio, you need to be aware of that. This is a way to, re to measure that reflected wave that might be coming back in your system. Ideally, there would be no reflections coming back. You would have a standing wave ratio of one to one. Um, that's perfect. It's kind of theoretical. It's never going to be perfect but you're going to get it as close to one to one as you possibly can to minimize that reflected wave coming back to your radio. So this black line here is like the sum total of the, the voltages of these two waves that are racing back and forth in your in your line. Um, you notice these little red spots, these nodes, they don't move. That's why we call it a standing wave because the amplitude Amplitude changes, but the wave never moves. You can always measure zero volts or at these red dots, and you can always measure a really high uh, fluctuating voltage uh, where these uh, domes and troughs are here in this in this standing wave that we have. So let's look at it from a different perspective. This is a this is like a worst case scenario. This is where the the, re the reflected wave is the same amplitude as the wave going out, and we see an infinity standing wave ratio. The standing wave ratio is dividing this point, the, the the smallest amount of voltage on the wire compared to the highest amount of voltage on the wire somewhere. And this is basically zero divided by something, so it's infinity, right? So this is the worst case SWR. This is S uh, infinity SWR. Now some other SWR waveforms might look like these dudes here. Um, in this case, we have a two to one I'm sorry, a 4 to 1 SWR, a 2 to 1 SWR, and then the infinity SWR that we just talked about. Um, so ideally what we want to see is perfect uh, perfect lines, perfect cylinders here. We don't want to see these lumps. Um, and that would be that where our signal's going out and nothing's bouncing back. So again, up at the top here, we've got a 4 to 1 SWR. So let's say this is a 4 volts up here, and this is 1 volt here, and this would be 0 down in the middle. This would be 4 to 1. And here we've got uh, maybe 2 volts here, maybe 4 volts total here. We've got a 2 to 1 SWR. You know, it's not horrible. But man, here's this infinity one where we've got this huge standing wave. We've got 0 volts in the middle. We've got maybe 4 volts up here. We divide 4 by 0, we get infinity SWR. Worst case scenario, all of our energy is coming back into our radio and really nothing's going out on our antenna. So this is just some examples of some different SWRs, kind of how to visualize them. So the next question is, what causes a bad SWR? So let's talk about impedance matching a little bit. Everyone says, well, everything's 50 ohms in ham radio. And that's true. You know, your radio is built kind of at an arbitrary 50 ohm uh, impedance point. Your coax is 50 ohms. Ideally, your antenna feed point should be 50 ohms. If at any point along that 
current path is it's different than 50 ohms you're going to see a little reflection coming back um, if it's infinity ohms or zero ohms it's all going to come back so if there's some variation maybe it's 100 ohms maybe it's 25 ohms it's like putting a little pinch in the pipe right there and you're going to get a little wave coming back at you and that's what really what we're trying to prevent here so looking how do we how do we narrow this down in our in our antenna we have meters that will measure swr um, you can, they have one here. This is like an inline meter. Um, this is a one by Yesu. This is, a, you put your radio and your antenna lines right there. They have more expensive ones like this guy. He's hooked up. He actually generates a signal and then measures the, the, the wave, the standing wave ratio and the, wa and the wave coming back. Um, so we also have something that to defend our radio. This is a defender. This will actually sense the, the waves coming back, coming up with a new tuning solution and reflect it back to your antenna and keep it out of your, your radio. Ultimately, the waves just race back and forth and just dissipate in heat in your coax. So this is an antenna tuner. Um, most people use these. If you, have a perf if you have a good antenna, you don't need one of these. Or maybe your radio has a tuner in built into it and, and you, you wouldn't need an external antenna tuner. So that's how that works. So to come up with ways to prevent high SWR ratios, and we need to understand a little bit about the, uh, the impedance, the perceived impedance or characteristic impedance of your, your radio, your feed line, and your antenna. Ideally, like I said, you want everything to be 50 ohms. Um, now, an antenna, let's, let's do a little bit of a, a drawing here, maybe. Let's see what a, an antenna looks like here. So I've got this, uh, I'm going to try this drawing thing. Let me guys know how this works here. So we've got, pick a cool color. We've got our little radio dude down here. You know, he's got a dial and some numbers and he's got uh, some coax that goes up here um, like this. This is our coax or our feed line. And then what you guys are probably going to do is put like an antenna out here and out there. And what this is going to do, it's going to have uh, electricity that's basically racing back and forth along this. Uh, feed line here and it's going to radiate into space now what's interesting is this white you know I know I know we said we chose 50 ohms for amateur radio it's kind of arbitrary this actual arrangement here is a 75 ohm uh, characteristic feed point right at the center there at your antenna so you're already at 1.25 to 1 SWR right out of the gate on these okay um, and that's assuming there's no reactants or, uh, you know, any other inductors or capacitance or any other things like that. We'll talk about that in a second. So right out of the gate with the flat top uh, dipole like this, we've got uh, a bad SW. It's not, I mean, it's not bad, it's, but it's, it's really not that good either. So let's, uh, let's change this up a little bit, see if we can fix this. Let's go back to this. Um, instead of having that flat top, let's go like this and like that. And now this, with at about 120 degrees, maybe 90 to 120 degrees, this feed point here is closer to 50 ohms. That's what we want. So if you're going to make a dipole, this is 75 ohms, this is 50 ohms. Okay, so do make an inverted V dipole. So at least you give yourself a fighting chance of having a good one-to-one -one SWR where all of the components in this system are exactly 50 ohms. All right, so I know what you're thinking. Okay, great, everything's done here. Um, we got a 50 ohm uh, antenna, I got 50 ohm uh, coax, 50 ohm radio. Um, SWR should be one to one. <laughs> That's barely the case. Now, in outer space, where you didn't have any other objects, or the antenna, you know, didn't re react with itself. Um, yeah, you'd be pretty really close to that. But you're, we're gonna need to talk about reactance, not just resistance. So 50 ohms is the characteristic resistance of this antenna. But there's something called reactance, and then really to explain reactance, we need to do talk about electric electrical or electronic theory here a little bit. Um, don't go to college and learn electrical components or, you know, uh, magnetic fields, electromagnetism. Um, it's not going to help. What you do do is you're, if you're a, in, in any kind of plumbing, um, there is a, uh, a water or plumbing analog to every type of electrical component. So <laughs> maybe we can just bear with me here a little bit. We're going to talk about the basic electrical components uh, from a plumbing perspective. So this here is a conductor, right? So it's a pipe, water flows through it. It's not that exciting. Um, getting more crazy here, this is a resistor. You know, when we talk about resistance, um, this is just resists the flow of water. That's a resistor, okay? 
Um, now we've got a capacitor, which is a object that uh, momentarily stores uh, electrical current, or in this case, it's momentarily storing water. It's like a little bladder right here, a little rubber bladder, and it stretches and then pushes back when you stop uh, applying pressure. So initially, there's no resistance when you apply a current to this, and then uh, when you stop applying, it pushes back on you. So that's a capacitor. Now, an inductor is a little more complicated. Think of an inductor as a water wheel or a turbine. So if we apply current initially to this, it resists resists current. But once you stop applying current, well, then it keeps supplying current. So they momentarily store a charge. That's what an inductor and a capacitor do. They momentarily store charges. And when we've got alternating current, that's really important. Uh, for completeness, this is a diode. A diode is simply a check valve. Okay, it's not that complicated. A transistor is a check valve with a switch. So it's an on-off switch. That's all it is. And then, of course, we've got a battery, which is just a pump. So this is how... Uh, this is every electrical component, or the ones we care about, uh, from a water or a, you know plumbing analogy. So let's take what we learned and about uh, capacitors and inductors. These are electronic components that momentarily store a charge, um, either in a magnetic or electric field. Um, and how does this apply to our uh, antenna system that we've got here? All right, so this is like an outer space. This is about 50 ohms. That's all fine and dandy, but unfortunately, um, the, the reason, actually, let's, let's talk about this. The reason a flat top, uh, let's draw this flat top antenna again here. I'll draw it with my, my pen. So we've got the flat top here. The reason this is 75 ohms uh, is because these two uh, wires are diametrically opposed, so they don't interact with each other. There's no reactants. Remember that word, reactants. Reactants is just an inductor or a capacitor messing with your system, screwing up your characteristic impedance at your feed point. All right, so that's why these are 75 ohms. You ever, and, and you ever notice why the cable company uses 75 ohm coax and the ham radio uses 50? Um, in theory, 33 ohms would be ideal for maximum power transfer. And in theory, about 79 ohms would be would I, more ideal for ma minimizing distortion, but not very good for power. So ham radio kind of split the difference and chose 50 ohms for the system, uh, whereas television, uh, uh, cable systems stuck with more of the 75 ohms. They just rounded down a little bit to, to minimize distortion. So that's why we have these arbitrary ohms. So back to this thing. So this is 75 ohm impedance. This basically has no reactance. The, the, the characteristic feed point resistance here or impedance um, and impedance is resistance plus reactance. All right, that's why I'm going to use the word impedance. Just think of it. The impedance is like a resistance for a, for a wave or some sort of alternating current. So let's let's knock this guy back here. So now when we move these two lines down, we we get not only resistance but we start getting reactants. So here's our inverted V. Now we we start seeing reactants between these two guys. They're talking to each other. So as current flows down one of these, um, the magnetic field emanated from that screws with this line and and induces a current in the other one. That is reactant. So you're getting some sort of capacitance, some sort of inductance there. Um, what's worse is you've also got like the, uh, you know, you've got the ground as well um, here. This is the ground under our antenna. And we, to make it even worse, um, we, we get this reactance between our antenna and the ground. That throws off our characteristic feed point uh, resistance or impedance. Um, you know, you're always going to have your shack here hanging out. You know, this is you and your shack. I'll draw a little roof here. And most shacks have like, you know, metal gutters that go around them like this. <laughs> and again, you're going to get reactance. It's some sort of capacitance or inductance. Something this, these objects around your antenna are going to store and release charges uh, with each wave that comes through from your radio. And it's going to screw up your characteristic feed point. Um, it's not going to be 50 ohms anymore. It's going to be a question mark. And that's where these meters come in. They're going to tell you what your standing wave ratios are and give you an idea to what the characteristic feed point resistance is. So if you've got it like a 75 ohm characteristic feed uh, resistance at your feed point, impedance, um, that's going to be 1.25 to 1 SWR. If it feels like about 100 ohms at the feed point, um, that's going to be a 2 to 1 SWR because we're just doubling 50 ohms, which is our ideal uh, impedance. So anyways, this is this is how reactance and resistance will work together to come up with the, to create the standing wave that you really don't want in your system. So get your resistance down to 50 ohms um, and then get rid of any reactance. Um, so the impedance will ultimately be 50 ohms. Sometimes you can use inductors and capacitors. Let's say you've got a bad, you know, your antenna is tangled up or uh, 
I don't know, maybe you've got some, you know, extra wire hanging down here. And so your feed point resistance is screwed up. You can actually use some of those reactants to your benefit. But what you really want is a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms with a combined resistance and reactance. And that'll be your impedance. All right. So that was all the technical mumbo jumbo. All right, since it's really not possible for us to calculate all of those weird uh, reactances, you know, in our antenna system, um, what we can just do is measure that standing wave ratio. That'll, that's really the important thing. And we're going to, you can use one of these meters to do it. Um, this meter is an inline one. It's cheaper. Um, you have to calibrate this every time you use it. So what you do is you plug in your radio, you start transmitting uh, while it's in calibrate mode. You twist the little knob until the... The meter reads like, uh, I don't know, zero or one, whatever it says in the instructions there. And then you do a transmission in SWR mode and you'll see your needle move. And it'll tell you what, if your standing wave ratio is, you know, two to one, one to one. Um, that's really telling you what your characteristic impedance is for your antenna system. So that's what this guy does. Uh, a more expensive version of that is this guy you guys might, might be familiar with. This, this is an SWR meter from MFJ. I don't know, maybe I can move me around here. Guys, can you guys see this? Hey, check that out. <laughs> cool. I'm going to turn it on. This is actually plugged into my uh, 20 uh, fan dipole in the back. And we can tune it up. We can look at it for 20 meters. And this will actually tell you the resistance and the reactance. Uh, it gives you a good estimate. So actually, my resistance is 63 ohms. That's pretty, that's pretty good. Reactance is 5. I'm not sure what the units are for the 5. But combined together, we get an SWR reading of 1.2 to one. Okay, that's pretty darn good. There, there, there's very few waves being reflected back. The whole system is generally 50 ohms. That's fantastic. Now, as you can see, as we go off frequency, let's, I'm going to go way up and go in some insane 15 megahertz. You know, this isn't a ham frequency, but we can see our SWR is way off the hook at 2.6. That's not bad, but I, you know, I wouldn't transmit into that. The resistance is somewhere around 28. Reactance is 30. So we're getting all kinds of weird reactance and resistance that's really changing the characteristic impedance um, of our system here. Um, so what can we do about that? We can use one of these antenna tuners, like I said. Um, this you put in between your radio and your antenna. There's those two jacks there. Maybe I can make this bigger. I don't know which, which video is going to win. I'll make myself smaller. <laughs> this is an antenna tuner. So this senses those waves coming back and it comes up with a reactant solution using capacitors and inductors and reflects that wave back. And that wave will bounce around a little bit and ultimately be dissipated into heat. So just because you're using an antenna tuner doesn't mean suddenly your antenna system has a cool characteristic impedance of 50 ohms and you have perfect one-to-one -one SWR. No, you don't. You still have bad standing wave between your antenna tuner and your antenna. Um, it's just not all of that current's not coming back into your, your power amplifier and your radio. Most radios will, have, will detect bad SWR, bad match. It'll sense that current coming in, that wave being reflected, and then they'll lower their power down to protect themselves. So if you're looking at a, if your radio's getting like a 1.8 to 1 SWR, it's detecting that, it's going to start reducing power, what they call folding back power to, to protect itself. So ideally, you want to be about 1.8 to 1 or lower. 1 to 1's ideal, it's kind of a theoretical thing, but since we don't live in outer space and have perfect antennas and feed lines, um, it's something you're going to have to consider. All right, so that is standing wave ratios in a nutshell. It's kind of like standing wave ratios for dummies, but I know you guys are pretty smart. I mean, if you clicked on this video, you're obviously <laughs> into some pretty weird radio stuff. Um, get your uh, uh, your characteristic SWR down as close to one-to-one -one as you can. Your radio will be happy. Um, your signal will emanate, radiate into space rather than just heating your, your feed line. So that's why SWR is important. All right, guys, thanks for hanging out with me, and uh, thanks to the patrons for making all of this possible. Uh, patrons uh, help with the videos here, patreon.com slash km6lyw. Not only do we get to generate cool content here, but you also get access to the DigiPi SD card image, and it's a Raspberry Pi uh, uh, image. <laughs> I don't know if I have one laying around here. Um, that has every data mode you can think of on it, and you can operate it using nothing more than your Wi-Fi device. So if you've got a phone, Raspberry Pi, um, it, uh, 
and you're a patron and you get download the SD card image, uh, you can operate every data mode you can think of uh, uh, via your phone or Wi-Fi device. You don't need to be an expert. So we're making data modes more accessible with the DigiPi project. And again, that goes to patrons of the channel. And I really got to thank you guys. Afu, Steve, uh, Mark, Ryan, Brian, Jake, Christopher, Ian, Tony, Jim, Brad, Michael, Malcolm, Buddy. I don't know. I'm trying to do all these in one breath. Kevin, Robert, Kevin. It's two Kevins. Thank you, Kevins. I appreciate it. Paul, William, Robert, Jeffrey. Hey, Jeff, thanks for all you did. Hey, thanks for the digipi.org domain name. So digipi.org. Yeah, Jeff got that for us. Thank you, buddy. Uh, Andrew, David, David. God, lots of Davids. Armando, Bill, Sean. We should do statistical analysis of, of people's first names and ham radio operators to see if there's correlation. Hey, Jay, Roger, thank you. Gordon, Shane, John. Multiple Johns. Anthony, Anton, uh, Peter. Thank you, buddy. Brian, Wingate. Thank you. You, Ronald, Ryan, Ship, Dale, Atkins. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. All right, this has been another KM6 LYW radio production. Uh, this one was a little techy. Let me know if you know if you think this presentation was okay. I'm trying to use my tablet here, and my drawing skills are just horrible. So I, mean, I don't know if we'll do the whiteboard thing again. All right, guys, I really appreciate it. Uh, again, KM6 LYW. The name is Craig, and I am clear. <laughs>